My name is Tom Winter. I'm from the University of Utah and will be speaking about the Cavum septi pellucidae in utero. Okay, well we're going to be talking about the Cavum septi pellucidae in utero. I have no relevant disclosures. And we'll divide the talk up into several sections. We'll talk about uh, what it is first, embryology, anatomy, and etymology. And then most importantly, we'll talk about why does it matter and give four reasons why we need, need to care about it. And then we'll finish up with some imaging pitfalls. So if you had asked me 20 years ago about the CSP, this would have been my response there. And I can't imagine how many cases I missed over the years because I didn't think about this. There's a great quote that my partner, Paula Woodward, uh, uses all the time to the residents that has been attributed to the author of Sherlock Holmes. And that's, you see what you look for, and you look for what you know. And before I knew about the CSP or thought about it, I never saw it, and I never saw its absence. So hopefully this lecture will help us with that problem. So what is the CSP? Remember that in embryology, you have two cerebral hemispheres, the telencephalons, and they split. And so think of the CSP as that longitudinal cerebral fissure between the two hemispheres, which becomes walled off on top by the corpus callosum and walled off below by the fornix. So this is the CSP right here. The etymology, I um, worked with a Latin professor on campus to figure this out. But cavum is Latin for basically a cave or a hollow space. Septum is Latin for a wall or enclosure, like the nasal septum. And then there are suffices in Latin. Septum is neuter singular, septa is plural, and septi is genitive. And this is very equivalent to, in English, the apostrophe S, like the dog's bone or God's son. And then pellucidum is Latin for translucent or clear. So when we're saying cavum septi pellucidae, literally we're saying the cave that belongs to the clear walls. So it actually makes some sense there. Um, in the past, it's been called the septum lucidum or the fifth ventricle. That's kind of a bad term because it doesn't communicate directly with the CSF. But embryologically, it's important because around 12 weeks gestational age, the corpus callosum starts to develop from the lamina terminalis as a bundle of fibers that connects the two hemispheres. Remember that a commissure is the connection between the two hemispheres, and depending how you count it, there are six or seven, but by far and away the biggest is the corpus callosum. And this development of the corpus callosal commissure is intimately associated with the development of the septa pellucida, the two paired cleared membranes. And why that's important we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, to make it even more confusing, there's one physical space between the two septa pellucida, the two clear membranes, but for whatever silly reason, it has two different names. In front, it's called the cavum septi pellucidae, and in the back, it's called the cavum virgae or virgae, and the dividing point is the foramen of Monroe. Uh, virgae came from Virga's ventricle, and it was the cavity described by the Italian anatomists in 1851, which is known as the sixth ventricle, which is an equally silly term. So here's a diagram showing this single physical space, but in front it has one name, the CSP, and in back it has another name, the C cavum virgae, and then there's a whole bunch of other fluid collections. Here's the um, cavum uh, vellum intrapositum. So in most individuals, the cavum is closed early in childhood and the two septa are fused. So this cave starts to get smaller and smaller as the two clear walls come together. The two clear walls fuse. So now we use the Latin singular because there's one membrane. So we use the singular suffix and it's now known as the septum pellucidum. This closure of the CSPA virgae begins at about six months of age and progresses from back to front, like a lot of things do in the brain. By term, closures occurred posteriorly in 97%, so there's generally only a true CSP at birth. And by three to six months, the CSP is closed in 85% of us, although in a minority you get a uh, small residua till adulthood. So this is normal, we have the cavum Sep, or we have the septum pellucidum, just the clear membrane in no space. And then here's the cavum septi pellucidae. In the literature, I got this from the web, 
often uses a misnomer. So this should be the cavum septi pellucidi, not the cavum septum pellucidum because this means singular and there's obviously two clear walls there. So here's some normal anatomy. Here are the two clear walls. Here's the cave in the coronal image. Here are the two clear walls and here's the cave. In utero MRI, two clear walls, cave in between. Coronal, two clear walls, cave in between. In a postnatal ultrasound, we see the corpus callosum. We see the two clear walls, and here's the cave. Here's a premature infant, and so it's much bigger because the cavum virgi is still making up the bulk of this. So it goes all the way back. This is not a high-riding third ventricle or an interhemispheric cyst. This is just the CSP, a virgi. And here's a normal term infant postnatally showing a much smaller CSP in front and no cavum virgi. And again, this is a normal variant here in a later gestational age fetus showing the fluid going all the way back. So is this the CSP right here? We have two walls, but notice that there's a line going down the middle, something we didn't see before. So this was a superb article by Peter Callan in the UCSF group talking about this pitfall. We want to take our image of the CSP further um, cephalid right here. If we take it further caudally, we're going to pick up the uh, columns of the fornices. Now remember the fornix is a bunch of white matter tracts that is, uh, takes the output from the hippocampus and it's very, very important in laying down memory. And if you're too far down, you will pick these two fornices right next to each other. So this is where we want to take the image. If we mistakenly take it too far down, we'll get an image of these two fornices. Um, so let's talk about the etymology of the fornix before we finish up right here with this section. So the fornix means a vault-like or arch structure, and it comes from Latin arch, vault, or vaulted chamber. And given how my mind works, I was kind of curious why the term fornix is used for the fornices in the brain and also the English word fornication. And it turns out that in ancient Rome, prostitutes more or less hung out around the arches surrounding the Colosseum. And in Latin, the act of carrying on an illicit sexual relationship came to be called going under the arches or fornication. So here's a picture of the Colosseum showing the arches there. And this is pretty much the only thing that my residents remember from this talk. But here's two more examples of the columns of the fornix. Now this isn't for sure, there's some disagreement, but I like this theory, it explains it, saying that when you have the two uh, paired fornices like this, and in the midline is the interface, and where they're co-opted, we get that white line down the middle. So the CSP has a line on either side like this does, but it shouldn't have the white line down the middle. Here's normal, white lines on either side, but the white line of the midline is not present. So we're gonna come back to that, but that's a pitfall. So now let's go ahead and talk about why it matters. The first reason, um, we all know that the guidelines are really standards, even though we've tried to call them guidelines, the lawyers use these as standards. And there's various iterations of them. This is the most recent that I found published last um, summer, but this is ACOG, ACR, SRU, AIUM out there. And in their guidelines for an obstetric exam, they list six things that we need to do in the head. If you're a lumper like I am, it's really three things. So the cerebellum and the cisterna magna is one thing, the choroid plexus and the lateral ventricles is another thing, and the midline falcs and the cavum septi pellucidi is another thing. So that's reason number one why it matters. It's required by the so-called guidelines, which are actually standards. Okay, now let's get on to something more interesting. Here's one fetus, axial view through the ventricles, Here's fetus number two, a coronal view through the head. And here's fetus number three, an axial view through the head. Both of these are obviously MRs. What's your diagnosis in all three of these fetuses? And the answer, of course, is agenesis of the corpus callosum or hypogenesis of the corpus callosum. This is one of the most common CNS anomalies out there. 
prevalence varies depending on pretest probability, but up to 5% in the developmentally disabled population. In the reference that I used, it was associated with major cerebral or extracerebral malformations, including 50 different human congenital syndromes. I heard Ruth give one of her always superb lectures uh, a couple months ago, and her reference used 2,000 syndromes. But bottom line, agenesis or hypogenesis of the corpus callosum is associated with a lot of stuff. One thing to remember at the, about the brain, this comes from another great paper from the UCSF group, but if you see one thing, keep looking. In the case of agenesis, there's up to an 80% risk of associated brain anomalies, including dandy walker, gyral anomalies, heterotopia, etc. And not to be forgotten, up to a 60% risk of things outside of the brain, heart disease, MSK, GU. So bottom line, if you see agenesis, there's a lot of bad stuff in the brain and a lot of bad stuff away from the brain. Prenatal diagnosis of agenesis is tough. We miss this a lot as a society there. So the easiest way to pick it up is when you don't see the CSP on the axial transthalamic view. In practice, it's generally big enough that you'll often see it on the lateral ventricular view and even the cisterna magna view because remember that's a 20 degree angled suboccipital bregmatic plane, so that comes up higher. Now there are a whole bunch of additional indirect signs that we've all been taught, the colpocephaly, the preferential dilatation of the occipital horns, increased separation of the hemispheres with the body of the lateral ventricles parallel to each other and shifted laterally, an abnormal third ventricle which extends upward between the lateral ventricles in a half of cases, the so-called high riding third ventricle, and an abnormal course of the pericolosal artery. The problem is, as much as we study for these on tests, in practice, people miss these. So look at this fetus. We have preferential dilatation of the occipital horns, parallel lateral ventricles. On the coronal view, you have this various names. If you're from Texas, the hook'em horns appearance. Um, if you're a Vikings fan, it looks like the horns on a Viking helmet. And then look on the sagittal view, there is complete agenesis of the corpus callosum. Here's another one, parallel lateral ventricles, hook'em horns appearance on the coronal view. And then on the sagittal view, we have hypogenesis. Remember that the corpus callosum starts at the genu and then moves posteriorly towards the um, the rostrum, and then the body in the splenium up here. So all we have is the genu. Pitfall, high riding third ventricle. So we talked about that. You don't have the corpus callosum as the roof between that cavity that's formed by the fusion of the two fissures right there, the splitting of the two fissures. And so if you don't have the corpus callosum as a roof, the third ventricle floats high, just like a helium balloon. And for the purist in the audience, there's a lot of discussion about high-riding third ventricle, inner hemispheric cysts, but we're just going to use the conventional terms here. And notice that we have preferential dilatation of the occipital horns of the lateral ventricles. Associated with lots of things, as we talked about, here's a classic Dandy Walker malformation. We heard a lot about this yesterday. Dandy Walker malformation. And then we have fluid up here, but do you see the clear walls? No. Colpocephaly with marked ventricular megaly. And then notice that even though we have fluid in front, we don't have the clear walls. And here's the video clip showing the uh, Dandy Walker variant, whatever they're going to call it nowadays, and nothing that's a true CSP anteriorly. Here's the MR showing the hook and horns appearance on the coronal and then agenesis of the corpus callosum with Dandy Walker malformation. Parallel lateral ventricles, and then vermian agenesis, uh, splitting of the cerebral hemispheres in the big cyst. Here's another fetus, you know, kind of scary because the cisterna magna looks great, but remember how we said that you can see the cavum septi pellucidi on that oftentimes. But on this one, we're not seeing it up here. Here's the high riding third ventricle, not the cavum, the cavum's in front. And then notice that we have T2 uh, hyperintensity posterior to the globe. So, what's your diagnosis here? This is for the syndromists or the genetics counselors in the audience.
but this is a Cardi syndrome, which is uh, initial description was infantile spasm, agenesis, inocular abnormalities. But in a female fetus, if you see agenesis with a posterior foster malformation, cortical dysplasia, and eye abnormalities, this was a coloboma, think of acardi. It's X-linked, it's lethal in men, so you don't see it there. And postnatal retinal exam confirms the diagnosis. So again, high riding third, no cavum there, female fetus, parallel lateral ventricles, coloboma here, acardi syndrome. Here's another fetus. Notice how we don't have a sylvian fissure on this side. The high riding third ventricle or the interhemispheric cyst. And then here's the interhemispheric cyst and multiple planes from a uh, 3D ultrasound showing no true cavum in front. So that's the second reason why we do this. Um, it's the common and difficult to diagnose. Agenesis of the corpus callosum, including weird things like acardi. We miss this as a society all the time. There's all the secondary signs, but if you just think absence of the CSP, the first nine things on your differential are going to be agenesis or, corp or hypogenesis of the corpus callosum. Okay, let's move on to another reason here. We have fluid in front, axial and coronal, but what's missing? We don't see the two walls, the two septa pellucida. They're not present. Here's this fetus postnatally. We don't see the two walls. So what's your diagnosis in this case? This is septo-optic dysplasia. This is absence of the cavum, hypoplasia of the optic nerves, and various types of hypothalamic pituitary dysfunction that lead to all sorts of problems there. It's interesting they can actually diagnose this in utero by testing hormones in mom's urine because the fetus should be producing hormones that don't get produced if you have hypothalamic pituitary dysfunction and you can measure that in mom. If you're a lumper, this is the most mild form of holoprosencephaly. If you're a splitter, it's a second, a second diagnosis. When I was reading for this and other papers, I was struck by how much heterogeneity there is in the literature, how much argument all the stuff that we learned in medical school or residency where they put these diagnoses into neat pigeonholes really doesn't work. But the only way you're ever going to make this diagnosis prenatally is to see absence of the cavum. There are no other secondary signs. We can't visualize the optic nerves or the hypothalamus or the thalamus with the required degree of anatomic resolution. So again, there's fluid up here, but where are the clear walls? They're absent. This was septo-optic dysplasia. Here's another fetus. There's fluid up front, but there's no clear walls. No clear walls, um, no septa pellucida on the axial MR. And on the postnatal scan, again, no clear walls. So this is the third reason why we want to look for the CSP. We're looking for the uncommon and very difficult to diagnose entities like septo-optic dysplasia. And in the last 12 minutes right here, let's talk about a whole host of midline abnormalities. We don't need absence of the CSP to make this diagnosis because there's a lot more going on, but it's a nice way to review a vehicle, if you will, to review midline anatomy. Now, Ann reviewed some of this yesterday, but basically ventral induction takes place during weeks 5 to 10. There are three primary vesicles, the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. But since we're in medicine, we have to have fancy uh, Greek and Latin deserved, derived roots for these. So we have the prosencephalon, the mesencephalon, and the rhombencephalon. Same thing as forebrain, midbrain, hindbrain. And then four secondary vesicles, the telencephalon, which is the cerebral hemispheres, and the diencephalon, which is the thalamus and the hypothalamus. For the purposes of this talk, where we're talking about the midline, all we care about is the prosencephalon. So we've got a paper coming out in a couple months talking about the full spectrum of holoprosencephaly. What I learned in medical school was the Demeyer uh, classification, a low bar, semi-lobar, and low bar. There are other classifications out there, but this is the main one. Then in the 1990s, Dr. Barkovich, the guru of uh, brain anatomy, came up with a fourth variant called the middle interhemispheric um, variant or syntelencephaly.
But that's all part of this spectrum here. There's a more severe part of the spectrum. Over here we have anencephaly, then aprosencephaly, absence of the forebrain, and atelencephaly, absence of the cerebral hemispheres. Then there are less severe forms, then there are several of those, and then there's two specific forms called minimal and microform. So we're just going to focus on the Demeyer spectrum right here, but this is classic A low bar. Um, we heard Phyllis talk give some beautiful examples of it in the first trimester, the fused thalami, the monoventricle, the solitary cortex there. Here's a really pretty view on a sagittal MR, the so-called balling cup appearance, where you have the residual cortex here and a huge amount of fluid in the back. Then there's a spectrum from a low bar to semi-low bar to low bar. There's no absolute delineation there, but notice that we have fused cortex across the front of the brain and on the MR, the homolog, the fused cortex across the front of the brain. Then in low bar holoprosencephaly, the cleavage continues successfully from posterior to rostral right there. So we do have some separation up high, but if you go down towards the um, cribriform plate, there's fusion there. And what is this? This is really classic. Learn to look for this. This is the fused fornices, coming back to those ever-present fornices there. And Dr. Palou from Italy wrote a nice paper talking about how if you see this, it's pathognomonic for a low bar prosencephaly. My partner, Ann Kennedy, had a nice paper saying that's a great rule, but there are some exceptions, and they went over the exceptions. But bottom line, if you see the single cord here, think fused fornices, and the first thing you should think of is low bar holoprosencephaly, but realize that it's um, also seen in other things. Obviously, we don't need absence of the CSP to make the diagnosis right here. There's so much more going on. And then here's what was described in the 1990s by Barkovich. Here's an in utero scan showing cleavage in front, cleavage in back, but on this coronal autopsy that we did for the parents, there's continuity of the cortex across the vertex of the head up here. So this is called the middle interhemispheric variant. Here's a case that we had from last year where you can see on the axial images cleavage in front and back, cleavage in front and back, but on the coronal images, we go from cleavage in front to complete continuity across the midline here to cleavage in back. And clinically, this is equivalent to semi-lobar holoprosencephaly in terms of outcomes. Next, schizencephaly. I learned that this was a vascular insult of the MCA, kind of the more uh, accepted term now is a neuronal migrational anomaly, but it's complex. There are two types, the open-lipped and the closed-lipped, which are basically just on the spectrum there. This is a hard diagnosis to make in the second trimester, so non-visualization of the CSP may be your only clue. Wesley Lee had a nice paper talking about how absent cavum is noted in 70% of cases of kids with skis right there, particularly when it's bilateral. As we said before, like many things in the brain, the... Um, there are lots of other associations, big ventricles, agenesis, polymicrogyria, heterotopia. If you like etymology, this comes from the Greek schizo, which means I tear, split, or cut. This is where we get our schizophrenia diagnosis, and encephalos, which is brain, so a tear or split in the brain. And here you see on the ultrasound right here, here's the MR showing the open-lipped type. Notice on this one, we don't see the septa pellucida. So just because you see fluid, don't call it. Here's the open-lipped cleft here. And notice the reverberation artifact anteriorly. So you think, ah, it's just unilateral. But we miss a lot of bilateral schizes because of this artifact. In this case, though, on the MR, it was truly just unilateral. Next, hydranencephaly. Basically, the whole top of the brain just turns to mush. The classic explanation is a huge infarct coming from bilateral internal carotid artery occlusion. More recent data suggests that it might be viral in many cases. They have a great model in cows for this. And in monkeys, if you ligate the internal jugular veins bilaterally, you get the same thing. So combination uh, viral or vascular there. Obviously, non-visualization of the CSP is an expected finding, um, so we're not going to require that. But notice that we have midline structures, so this is not a low bar holoprosencephaly. We have a little bit of brain, 
And what happens is that you get a little bit of brain in the temporal lobes because you have collateral circulation from the basilar, vertebral basilar um, circulation right there, but basically nothing above that. But we still have separation, so this is not a lobar. Basilar encephalocele in Barkovich, when he described, talked about absence of the uh, septum right there, two of his three patients with uh, basilar encephalocele's had um, agenesis. So there's fluid, but there's no clear walls. Um, here's the classic basilar encephalocele. In the Western world, it's occipital. If you live in Singapore, it's frontal or syncipital. Here's the pretty 3D sagittal showing it. Obviously, prognosis depends on how much brain is out right there, but no CSP. And then finally, it's not real sexy, but it's common, chronic severe hydrocephalus from whatever cause. It could be aqueductal stenosis, it could be Chiari 2, it could be anything there. But in this case, the CSP formed, and it was normal embryologically, but then the severe hydrocephalus just tore it, like the sheets of a uh, old-fashioned sailing ship in a gale right there. It just gets fenestrated and ripped. And this is actually one of the more common causes, um, just because hydrocephalus is common. So in this case, which was aqueductal stenosis, we have big lateral ventricles. The pressure from the big ventricles just tears or fenestrates the septa pellucida. So that was our fourth reason, an excuse to review a whole host of midline abnormalities right there, from holoprose to skis to hydrian, basilar encephalocele, and chronic severe hydrocephalus. This is usually what the residents say to me when I talk too much. So let's just finish with uh, four pitfalls here, and we'll go through these one by one. Pitfall number one from Peter Callan's paper, if you take your plane of section too far inferiorly, you're getting the paired columns of the fornices with the coaptation of the fornices in the middle, making this white line. This hypoechoic area is not fluid. It's actually the fiber tracks in the fornix. Um, and again, if you're a purist, there's some debate about this, but this is the most accepted explanation. Next, don't confuse the high-riding third ventricle or a prominent interhemispheric fissure for the cavum. The cavum should be further rostral here. This is in the midline. You have no corpus callosum. The third ventricle floats up like a helium balloon. Number next, normal variant CSPA virgi. And so this is not a high-riding third ventricle. This is not an interhemispheric cyst. This is the normal cavum. It's just a little bit bigger than normal. Most people say it's a normal variant. And number four, to quote one of the gurus, Roy Philly, don't make it up. There are no clear walls here. So we have fluid in front, but we don't have the clear walls. So don't just say, oh, there's fluid up there, but this was a case of septo-optic dysplasia, and we saw other cases of schizencephaly. So why does it matter reviewing the four um, reasons? Number one, we have to do it by the guidelines. Remember, those are de facto standards. Number two, and most importantly, the common and difficult to diagnose. This is one of the easiest ways to pick up agenesis of the corpus callosum. Number three, uncommon and essentially impossible to diagnose entities like septo-optic dysplasia. We've had four of these in the last two years. And then number four, it's an excuse to review a whole host of midline abnormalities, and we went through some cool embryology there. So to review the talk, we talked about what it was from embryology, anatomy, and etymology. We talked about why it matters, the four main reasons, and we talked about imaging pitfalls. I want to thank Professor Toscano um, with all the Latin. Any mistakes in here are mine, not hers. And if you like the talks, go to the NASA Astronomy Picture of the Day if you like the pictures and they have some gorgeous images up there. Thank you very much.